Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today for another discussion about artificial intelligence. Today, we're going to talk about how it is that you can use artificial intelligence to facilitate invention disclosure and on your way to a patent application or perhaps on the way to a patent application, uh, or at least get a better idea of what the inventor has actually invented. Um, earlier this week, we talked about what happens when the artificial intelligence is the inventor. Today, we're gonna to talk about when the inventor is actually a human and is gonna then rely on artificial intelligence to help describe what it is that they've created. So Artificial Intelligence Week here at IP Watchdog, and we're lucky to have Kate Godry here as the common thread between the two webinars. I'll introduce her properly here in a minute. So we thank you for joining us wherever you may be for this webinar. So let's just get started right off the bat. And first off, I'd like to thank IP.com for sponsoring this webinar. They've sponsored several of our webinars in the past. They are uh, one of our good sponsors. We really appreciate them. And I would really appreciate it if you find yourself in need of any of their services, if you would reach out and inquire, I really appreciate that. You know that IP Watchdog is a freemium model. That means we bring content to you for free. And then we rely on our sponsors and bring to you what it is that they are offering and uh hopefully they'll find you'll find it useful and um that's how this whole thing works so please at least inquire if you find a need for what they're offering and i think based on what we're going to show you here today we got some really cool stuff to show you i'm pretty jazzed about it and i think if you're a patent attorney you're going to understand the problem straight away uh and if you're a business person we're going to talk about why that's a, a problem as well with respect to uh, getting the proper disclosures, but they work with Fortune 1000 companies and uh, governments all around the world. So uh, please take a look at what they offer. They're a great sponsor of ours. Thank you, IP.com. Now, two of my favorite guests are joining us here today. Carlo Catrone, he's been with us a number of times. Those of you who have joined us in the past probably know Carlo. Carlo is now Chief IP Counsel at Tectonic Industries. They have some of the most iconic brands in the in the world really if you walk through the hardware store you can't help but bump into some of their brands they own ryobi and hoover for example old milwaukee many others uh he's their uh chief ip counsel he has also had a lot of experience with uh, ge healthcare and then with baker hughes oil and gas so he has a breadth of experience and i always like bringing carlo on whenever we're gonna talk about a business topic, because he's written on IP Watchdog a lot about the business of IP, and also how do you incentivize your, the people who work for you and create a, an environment in which they can thrive. And that's something we're gonna talk about here today. He's he's the authority on, on those topics of how you created a, a thriving department. And then Kate Grodry, quite frankly, I don't think there's anybody that I know that knows AI and machine learning better than she does. She has a PhD in neurobiology and just is way smarter than I am. And you know, so I always like having her aboard when we're talking about these issues. And she's a partner at Kilpatrick and Townsend. So thank you both for joining us. And then we also have Jim Durkin joining us. And Jim is a former patent examiner, but now he is a product manager at IP.com. And he is gonna talk to us a lot. He's also a registered patent attorney and he is an inventor himself. And he is going to talk to us about what it is that uh, IP.com has done to help inventors using AI. So I'm pretty jazzed and excited about this as well. So what I'd like to do is bring in the panel here to start us off. And as I always do, open ended questions so you guys can take it where you want initially. Um, and let's go in the order in which I introduced you. Uh, Carlos, starting with you, what do you want people to think about as we talk about AI assisting inventors with disclosure or the importance of disclosures or whatever the topic is you'd like them to focus on at the outset? Thanks, Gene. I guess what I, what I would offer, we can look historically to how this has been done, some of the challenges, which I know will we'll cover in a little bit more detail as, as we move along. But I don't think necessarily technology has been a significant component of tackling those challenges. I mean, often it's a, it's a people-based exercise. There's some use of uh, 
in partnering with outside counsel, use, working with in-house colleagues as well, doing some searching perhaps that will inform the process. But the technology piece is something I think that all it behooves all of us to really start seeing how we can leverage to really raise the value here because often really the sum of the parts will get us a lot further than we would otherwise and, and make that impact for competitive reasons for a lot of reasons. Okay, great. Thanks, Carlo. Kate, your, your initial thoughts. Earlier this week, we talked about when the AI is the inventor. Now we're talking about when the human is the inventor and um, maybe doesn't have the the words to be able to describe what they've come up with. Right, Jane, and I was, I was thinking the same thing in terms of how this ties to our earlier discussion on Tuesday. So here, AI, we're talking about AI as a tool, and this can be a really valuable tool, but I think that a lot of the value comes with the human behind the scenes thoughts in terms of what are the company's priorities for patent applications? What types of details do we wanna make sure we have in the patent applications? How do we envision our workflow of mining for inventions and filing inventions? And after all of that backend strategy is done, AI can just take off and really set the stage and handhold inventors through the process. But what's really important for our discussion today is making sure that that workflow, that automated workflow, is tied to this backend strategy. Yeah, yeah, it's got to always, it's got to always, and that's something Carlo will talk with him about. He's written a lot about is to make sure that you have a strategy, you know, because a lot of times people are just throwing stuff up against the wall, and that, you know, maybe once upon a time that was a strategy, but you know, with budgets the way they are now, it that is no longer, if it ever was a strategy, that just can't be your strategy today. Jim, your your thoughts here today. I, I know you're pretty jazzed about what's what we're gonna unveil, but what do you wanna talk to folks about at the very outset? What should they be thinking about here? Well, I, I couldn't be more excited, Gene. Uh, this is the, the first time and it's great to show some of this at IP Watchdog uh, for some of our newer offerings, but something for people to keep in mind is how um, at your organizations can you take the best practices of the most prolific inventors and apply them on an organizational basis? And I think a challenge people run into is often the scenario of robbing Peter to pay Paul. You want inventors to focus on innovating. They're, even the most prolific inventors are not all experienced searchers. They don't um, uh, all interface with patent attorneys or agents on a daily basis. You have to think about um, having optimal use of everyone's time. And from uh, artificial intelligence, particularly if you start viewing it um, as augmented intelligence, as you know, your title calls out, can be a huge process accelerator and help the organization leverage some of those best practices from top inventors uh, through AI in an automated way. I think a lot of what we're showing here today is, um, for invention disclosures, similar to what you see on your phones with assistants like Siri and um, Cortana. So I'm very excited to show uh, some of that class of technology. Yeah, yeah, and let, let me, if I could just circle back a minute, Kate, to to pick up on something that Jim just said, because I wanna plant a seed so we don't lose it, because we talked about this yesterday in our, in our prep call about, um, you know, there was, I think it was you that said that once upon a time there was a, a company that you were familiar with that had a, a certain limitation on how long that the inventors were allowed to actually even participate in the patenting process, right? Yep, and that, that's right. that can really limit the output when that happens. Right, so you have to be particularly strategic there. And it's not to say the objectives behind that, it wasn't a hard rule. I think it was more of a guideline, um, but the objectives were, as Jim was saying, the inventors need to concentrate on inventing and not form submission and not proofreading. And so they wanted to make sure that we weren't rely over relying on them to generate figures or to fill out a very you know, extensive form or to answer any question that we might want to look up, right? And so it's, I think, tied well to our discussion here, the important things should be done by the inventors. Um, 
The patent attorneys are not the best source for that. But there's a lot of other tasks that are frequently involved in the mining and proofing um, stages that can get thrown on the inventors, and that is not a good use of their time. Right, right. Okay. So um, before I get going too much further, if you want these slides, you, you should be able to download them on your GoToWebinar control panel under handouts. And if you'd like to ask questions, there's a questions tab also on the GoToWebinar control panel. I'll be monitoring the questions and weaving them into the greatest extent that I can. Um, everybody will get this information sent to them after the fact. So uh, let's just jump off, Jim, and go through the few slides that you've created and then we'll get into the round robin conversation here. Sure. And this is just um, to know, you know, as I mentioned in the intro, calling out kind of thinking about your current process. How much are you putting on the inventors in this process and how much ancillary training is required to learn things like how to search or how to fill out um, uh, detailed invention disclosure forms. And all those kind of practices uh, take up quite a bit of time in organization and there's a second aspect to it that our software addresses, which is the prioritization. Uh, and I'll get to that in some of the next slides, but think about too, even once you have the information from the inventors, how are you prioritizing it and bringing it to your patent review committee? So if we can look at the next slide, Gene. So this is our inventors aid software. And it, um, can be bundled as well with uh, product IQ Ideas Plus, you can find on our website that also offers some brainstorming facilities. But today we'll be talking about Inventor's Aid. And what Inventor's Aid is, you're seeing here on the screen, is you can put in your problem, put in your solution in natural language English, and then uh, we can use some of our deep learning and natural language processing technologies to give you information that helps you draft a good idea itself. And this is the critical part, which is that it's already designed for how inventors think of problems, which is splitting up a problem and solution. And the analysis that occurs from the AI occurs within seconds automatically. And you get a score on the right here with an AI uh, concept evaluation that gives you hints about if you wanna add more details, for example, or if it's looking good to the system. It can show you some of the concepts that uh, the engine understands based upon your description of your invention and it can assess some additional criteria that can help you make sure that you've described it well like technical reading level for example now in this first step of the process and it's an easy three-step process the the really key part of it is that it's helping you write a good description good in the sense that it's focused and in the sense that the ai understands it i think one of the challenges with artificial intelligence um, is that you need to have feedback mechanisms in the software so that it's not a black box kind of situation. And by showing you some of the ways that the system is understanding it, you can very quickly get a focused invention disclosure, which is not only good for the human, it's also good for the machine. And this requires no background and search knowledge. And then when you click on the analyze button, if you can um, go to the next screen, you'll see that we can already start reviewing a lot of really interesting information. So in the upper left, we get a uniqueness score. And that uniqueness score is part of that second part of the process I was talking about. So not only crafting the, dis the disclosure or invention description, but also categorizing it. And that uses some of our proprietary technologies to put it in a rank of similar, unique, or very unique, so that you can fast track some of the ideas that the system believes is very unique and may warrant a quicker review by a patent committee. That can really help them. Um, especially with the first inventor to file these days. And you can see on the screen a number of other um, uh, kind of landscape type analysis or overview, which are easy to understand the breakdown by companies for the inventors in the technology space. And the next slide, uh, you can see the process here of reviewing uh, the patents. And the critical thing about this is that this part is all being automatically populated. It's automatically the top 10 references. Uh, those, those filters uh, are auto-populated based upon the close concepts that the engine is picking up. Um, and even some of the trends in the industry, you can see on the bottom uh, that section AI keyword trends, or we can do an analysis of what's uh, rising and falling. 
and then let you focus in on those areas. So the idea here and in our testing of this software is that um, most inventors will go to this screen after typing in the idea and getting some, some uh, positive feedback from the system initially. Then they'll get to this screen, review some of the results, maybe apply a filter or two, and typically iterate um, maybe one or two more times on the, on the description of the problem and solution. And then um, as I noted on the last screen, there's an export button. So you can get a report which is ready to go right to a patent review committee, uh, in-house or outside legal counsel. It's just a Word document. So uh, we try to design this system to be lightweight SaaS deployment where you don't have to um, uh, rip out any of your existing tool set. You can put this um, ahead of it right to the inventors and the engineers and get them ready for that collaboration with the IP department. So that's the idea on the on the on the software side of it, um, and then on the next slide, um, Gene. Uh, the result of this is that you can leverage a fast track innovation process. So you can go from that idea, make sure it's well described, get a good quality automatic search that lets the inventor focus more on the inventing and the iteration of the idea description, and not on subtleties of of, of search techniques. Um, It'll produce that report with that novelty score of the idea or the uniqueness score of the idea. And then you can categorize it for different tracks for the patent review committees. Uh, and ultimately this helps you get to the patent office quicker. And um, as you can see on the next slide, um, some of the, the benefits here is not only getting ahead of that first inventor to file, as I mentioned, but also one of the biggest time lags that uh, our, our clients have told us and that we found in the industry is the time for outsourcing patentability studies. And you can lose a couple of weeks there and it can also impact how the inventions are prioritized to the review committees. And the 10X ROI is an achievable number with the deployment of this software um, because the cost can add up quickly, especially uh, at organizations with which encourage and foster innovation because you get a large volume of disclosures. And it's only about one in every three to five uh, disclosures, depending on you know, which statistics you believe that'll turn into an actual patent application. Um, so if you wanted to say use AI to try to get that up to 10 disclosures, um, then the, the ROI continues to increase. Um, it becomes more feasible to, to, to invent um, at a higher volume. Uh, so that was the overview uh, I wanted to give on this. And uh, thank you, Gene. Sure, no problem. Now, Carlo, I want to start with you on Jim's, you know, last point there about uh, the disclosures, because, you know, we've we spent a little bit of time talking about this, and this is always, you know, a topic of interest with respect to the, the business end. How do you incent disclosures without incenting just garbage? You know, I and I'll I'll say the year many years ago, I don't think this company does this the same way now. It was a very large company, and they gave it was either twenty five or fifty dollars, something like that, for every idea. So I knew an engineer there. Whenever he needed extra cash, he would just sit at his desk and write ideas on this cardboard. You know, they had like these old school cardboard, and they had the old school submission, and he would just and they were just half baked except for the ones that were fully baked you know and he would just get extra cash for that you know it was like a 25 five dollar bill every one he put in you know and they were just crap um so you don't want that but you have to incentivize the right disclosures how do you create that culture that does that that's a, I mean, that's a big question gene and, and that sort of goes to what i was saying from the outset sort of this multifaceted approach because unfortunately when you have in my experience when you have that kind of activity sort of this um, throw everything against the wall approach where you're getting all these disclosures of questionable merit I mean to, to me that sometimes really evidence is something greater that is wrong perhaps with the innovation system at the company whether sort of messaging from the top or Kate, you sort of mentioned, I'll maybe expand on that. I mean, for some companies, the innovators have to track their time and charge their time against actual projects and budgets. So this IP, unless you have uh, this, this time you devote to the IP process, if it is not actually sort of supported by 
those on high, if you will, the actual leaders, then inventors are not going to really want to participate and, and the quality will be limited. So, I mean, in, in past lives, I mean, we have done things like um, vetting processes, filtering processes that are more human based where someone might have an idea, but they are then asked to go to a more senior colleague to really talk through um, the invention and, and do a, a sanity check. But I guess I would say the beauty of Jim, your technology that you're sharing with us, some of that actual vetting, which can be valuable actually could be done through automation and technology and it could drive um, some of this um, us in the, in the right direction. Yeah. So let, let me follow up a little bit because we have a question here now. And the, the question is submitted by, you know, somebody that, that I know. And um, it, it's it may sa sound like a, uh, an, an, uh, a question that comes from somebody who's not knowledgeable. But I think, it you know, if we stop and think about it, it's, it is a very good question. Uh, so I don't want us to rush past it. How, how many people are actually employed as inventors? as opposed to researchers or engineers where they have inventions as byproducts of the rest of their work. Now, you know, cause I think, you know, if you hear that question, you might just say, well, you know, that's a silly question, you know, engineers and scientists, all of them are inventors. All of them are potentially inventors. Everybody can really come up with an invention. But then, you know, when you were talking about they have to, some of them are tasked with actually project by project by project and making stuff. And then if they're gonna have to invent, that's gotta be charged against the project. And they, you know, it kind of seems like it gets us into the different philosophies of different companies question, right, Carlo? That's right. So I don't know that we can answer the question, but we can, I think, talk about the different philosophies, right? And we have a whole bunch of different philosophies in terms of there's the, well, anybody can come up with a good idea. And if you come up with a good idea, we'll pursue it and patent it. Or we're just gonna race to get up and running and into the market as fast as we can. Um, and you've seen a bunch of different business models. Can you kind of maybe talk a little bit about the different IP models you've seen and when and where and how they've worked and why? Sure, uh, and, and I wanna maybe steal uh, sort of a, a, some nomenclature for one of my great colleagues at Milwaukee Tool who heads up our IP uh, program, but, and, and he sort of voiced what observations I have, but I never really sort of expressed it that way. So, so one model or paradigm you could call a concept driven or a filing driven paradigm where essentially a lot of the disclosures are not necessarily going to be directed to what is actually embedded in products or technology just because of the nature of the technology. So that, that's one paradigm and, and that's where I think sometimes some of the maybe negative patterns we've alluded to that can really that's a, a danger zone because it's just like there isn't the alignment necessarily with actual products and, and business and so that can be sort of a vacuum that if you don't have like an IP strategy or you don't have directional guidance towards like extremely valuable, potentially uh, valuable IP, creating planting seeds, creating uh, portfolios that could be really forward thinking, then that vacuum can I think breed some of what we're talking about. But then contrast that filing approach driven approach or concept driven approach versus marketing driven or commercialization driven approaches where there is such a tight alignment and nexus between really what is going to provide the differentiating value for the company in the marketplace, what is going to protect the company's products, keep competitors at bay, allow the market exclusivity. So in that way, in that sense, in that second paradigm, I think naturally there will be incentives built into the system and you will have those from the very, very top who will trumpet sort of a very uh, excellent stewardship of IP resources because 
the reality is if you don't get it right, your lunch will be eaten, so to speak. So I think there is there is this broad spectrum. And then I think Kate, as we talked about, um, uh, and maybe Gina as well in our prep call, you also have startup enterprises where maybe sometimes these models don't fit as well, um, but there may be actually naturally in the startup context sort of very special care that will be taken to not fall into these uh, quandaries. But I would say there, like you say, Gene, there is this big spectrum. And so your targeting for success will definitely vary. And in certain instances, you need to really be more intentional or the absence of um, the strategy will lead to a lot of um, sort of ineffective disclosures. And, and unfortunately, sometimes the inventor award system is used as sort of a proxy for, to get people to do things, but it's just not really ultimately adding that impact. Yeah, yeah. And Kate, the issue of you know startups comes, and I know you've worked with some some startups, and you do a lot of the software and AI and machine learning, and some of the real exciting stuff comes from those companies that are in the startup uh you know the funded vc space or the you know the spin-off kind of space you know or you know the universities have come up with something and now they're you know racing and all those kinds of companies really need a different kind of uh finally at the very start right well i don't know if it's a different kind of filing i've seen a very wide spectrum uh, in terms of filing strategies I think what's most common is that startups have, are quite constrained in terms of their budget. And so they don't have a lot of money. And when you don't have a lot of money, you must patent what's core to your business. And so it's very clear and easy. You don't have a lot of people. You have the founders. They have this concept for where the what the business is going to do. And that's what your patent application is going to be on. Contrast that to well-funded startups. And then they can just come out of the gate and you know they're, they're prioritizing filing and they want to you know, announce their entrance and you know, let's get as much on file as quickly as we can so that we can start to uh, have some presence in this industry but actually if i can go back to your discussion with carlo for a minute sure sure um, Absolutely. in terms of just how the different business models can work one of the things that i had looked into uh for a while I was thinking about writing a paper on it, but I never came to a conclusion, so I never did. But I thought it was really interesting was what some companies do to try to encourage innovation. And it's not just patent submission, but it's real innovation. And so, for example, 3M, they they encourage, I can't remember exactly how, if it was through hackathons or um, I think maybe they gave their employees some period of time to just come up with ideas that were vaguely related to the um, company and that's how they came up with uh, that. What's that like little putty that's sticky? You, the you know what I mean, right? The yellow. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and sticky notes. Sticky notes was I think the very the big yep. thing that came out of that. And I could be getting a, a little bit of this wrong, but it was through this, you know, it, it, innovation it, encouragement at the company. And there are quite a few tech companies too that have established programs where if an engineer can make even a colorable case about something possibly relating to the business model of the tech company. And then they can have like 20% time or 10% off or anything like that to go explore it. And off, it's kind of a fuzzy line anyway, and they might be able to spend even more time on it. Right? And I think that in these situations, what the companies are envisioning, and I think is true most of the time, it's not your situation that you had um, brought up in the beginning, Gene, where it's just like a money maker, you know, like I'm going to take advantage of this company and I'm going to try to like, you know, get more free time off or, you know, get my free $25. But they are assuming that their employees are there to help them. And so they're really trying to get these employees who they value thinking creatively and not pigeonholing them, right? Not saying like, this is the very right. little thing that we make it a little more efficient or a little faster, right? And so if you can get those kinds of exciting concepts. And then the next stage is then file the patent application on it, right? But I find those business models to be really fun to think about when you're giving your employees quite a bit of freedom, you know, through this 20% time or hackathons or something of the sort. Yeah, yeah. And you got the uh, post-it note story exact, exactly right. That was the inventor was Art Fry, 
who I, I got to know a little bit a few years ago when he through the PTO and he did that through uh, at 3M through uh, extra time, 20% extra time. And, uh, and the genesis of that, just for those who were interested was he would go to church every Sunday and he was looking for something that he could mark the, the songs in advance. He was in the, I mean, he and his wife, I believe were, they were in the choir, you know, so something that they could, take off the page and put on the page that didn't affect the the hymnal um you know and they could mark it in advance and he was having trouble finding the right stickiness either it wasn't sticky enough or it was too sticky and uh they sent out uh he sent out a e company-wide email and s another inventor at 3m had put something literally on his shelf because for his project he was he needed something that was sticky and this became oh well this doesn't this is not sticky enough because it's removable. And so when he saw the email, he's like, I got exactly what you need, you know? So they worked on it and now, you know, they're both in the Inventor Hall of Fame and it's this extraordinarily successful product. Um, and that came from extra time. Google also famously gives its employees extra time or they did, I think they still do. Um, so I, it's about reaching that right, right balance. And, um, which is so important. And Jim, do you, let me ask you this. Do you, uh, I know that this is a, a new tool, but you, I'm sure you've demoed it and sh shown it and gotten some feedback. What are you hearing from the inventors who have used it, the engineers and scientists? Uh, are they excited to use it? Do, are they excited as like, I mean, I'm a geek, I'm a nerd. I would feel like this is great to get the help. I mean, when I write, I always have thesaurus.com open on my page because you know i'm always looking for the right word and to describe what i have in my head i would think as an inventor this would be great to really capture what they have in their their mind well uh, i couldn't be more excited about this class of technology and from the people that have used it because you're right we do have some users although this is our kind of our big general launch of this software um they find that that a lot of the value in it is that it is kind of, you know, fun to use. It's meant to encourage you to explore through it, look at the the landscape, get the information, and kind of go back and iterate on the idea organically. And I think that gets back to what you and um, Kate were just talking about, which is really, and there's an aspect of if you want people to really think creatively, um, I think you have to gamify it a bit. And you have to have that kind of idea that, there's some kind of intrinsic value as a scientist or engineer in exploring that, that ends up spurring innovation. And that's why I used a couple of the words I did when I described the software. I think one of the fundamental goals of it is to be a lightweight application that people can go in and actually want to have on their you know, browser every day and that they wanna keep going back into. And if it, if it starts looking like, um, uh, something that's that's formidable right then then i then i think that you lose a lot of the advantage of this kind of approach irrespective of the fact that the ai technology itself is very interesting but what's more interesting is kind of what, what you get out of out of using this kind of process at the inventor's desk instead of at a later stage yeah yeah and um it, it it's you know the, it's so important kate you know one of the things we've talked about is the in every patent attorney can uh, feel this pain. I'm sure you get the cryptic one sentence disclosure. And Carlo, you're shaking your head. I'm sure you've seen those come across your desk, and it's like, my God, what is what is even invented? You know. And I joke around with a a friend of mine who's uh, you know the other computer savant that I know uh, up in New York, and I always tell him, and the same thing I told you from time to time. It's like I, I suspect that probably every application he's ever written. And I, just like, I just think that every application probably you've ever written, you, you're an inventor, you know what I mean? Because, you know, I know what inventors give you and I know what then you turn it into, you know? And and I'm not, I, I'm kind of tongue in cheek, obviously, right? You know, because inventors work with you and it's their invention and so forth. But, you know, I mean, with some inventors, you know, they give you such cryptic uh, ideas and then you're expected to, turn it into you know a 50 page application with with 10 to 15 drawings and and 50 claims and it's like out of one sentence i'm supposed to do that i mean what do i look like i'm merlin 
I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I am pretty insistent on having a call um, because some of the disclosure materials that I get are so thin. And I think that that's in line with what Jim's technology is, right? This is a first yeah. step. And then you're going to the patent review committee and then you're bringing in the outside counsel. And that call is really important to get those details for me to be able to do my job. And sometimes even then it's hard because maybe we're starting out with an idea that didn't go through, you know, something like Jim's tool or a thorough uh, evaluation. And right. so and it's my job to say like, well, you know, you came to me with idea X, idea X is not patentable. So let's keep exploring the project. And, you know, it might mm -hmm. take you 45, 50 minutes to arrive at what might be potentially patentable. And by then you don't have too much time left on the call and people are busy and yeah. they don't want another call, right? And so those are the kind of situations where it's difficult and you need to be creative um, about how you're going to be describing these, especially given what we all know about patent examination. You don't know what that magic carrot's going to be, right? Um, you're gonna be, you're gonna have to guess how prosecution is gonna go and what details are you going to wanna pull in so that can be challenging if you don't have a thorough description, um, disclosure materials, or a, a good disclosure call. Yeah. Do you, uh, Kate? Just you know, uh, as an aside, do you ever record that call um, so that maybe you could transcribe part of it later on? And yes, sometimes we do that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I found that that can be very, very useful because sometimes the way because then it lets you focus on, you know, the interview, focus on getting the information out. And then when ideas pop into your head, you know, sometimes they can be expressed so perfectly the first time. And then when you search for it the second time, it just doesn't come out the same way. And so I right. found that recording that that call can be just so helpful. You know, because yeah, it, it, that always boils down to you know just client preferences because right, you know, right, some um, aren't comfortable with the recording and some want you make sure to delete it afterwards. Um, so right, there are some right. some clients where we don't, um, and and some where it is quite helpful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you always have to check with the client. I mean, and and certainly you know you, not telling it's just to make sure that everybody here says gene didn't say record the call what gene said is it can be helpful and gene has done it and when gene has done it gene has made sure everybody knows that it's being recorded <laughs> you know and and then you know then you have your client re your your document retention policies which you should have anyway you know i mean everybody should have them in place but you know i find particularly with inventors who sometimes have you know, struggle to um, tell me what it is that's really unique. Um, you know, getting getting it on a on in a recording can be very helpful. And then, particularly, you know, if you can then nowadays with you know uh, tools where screen sharing and so forth, and you can do it just like you're almost like you're cross examining and say, okay, what are we looking at here in this chart or in this graph or in this illustration? You know, and because when they have that in front of them, you know, they can tell you to talk about it all day long, you know, mm -hmm. but they may you not know, be able to go ahead. I have a colleague who would try would do these uh, video calls, the screen sharing calls, and he would try to end all of the calls with claim one drafted. Now, he is yep. more in the mechanical hardware space. And so I think it's a little easier to do on the fly than some of the software things, especially when it gets a little complicated and you want to be careful about your wording for 101 issues or divided infringement or whatever it is. But yes, I think, you know, having this discussion where you zero in on what's important by the end of it, that's irreplaceable. Now, having a really good disclosure like Jim's tool provides immense benefits um, because then I come prepared and I'm like, well, I see this little nugget that I think is really interesting that you glossed over. And so little do you know, but we're gonna spend 80% of our time on that, right? And so I know to ask <laughs> early on instead of finding out about it 40, 50 minutes into the call, right? And I can yeah. think about how I wanna structure that discussion. Yeah, I was going to yeah. make a quick comment on that, right. if I might. Okay, so I think right. Kate said it well, but I mean, disclosures really functioning as prompts to kind of take the conversation in, in, in different directions. But also, if you can get inventors to even moderately engage with the, the submission process where they start kind of feeling comfortable and start putting more information, I mean, that can actually help ultimately enrich 
the quality certainly of the patent application because at least when I've uh, been in private practice or work with outside counsel, I mean, I've always talked about mining the disclosure, any detail there, use it any way you can and don't just sort of um, skip uh, and, and really try to embed it in the written description. But I think using tools that w will help the inventor memorialize sort of what they are thinking in, in some way, even that goes beyond maybe um, the, the prior art that, that, that uh, your tool, Jim, will provide, which sounds extremely valuable, but even just sort of that, that engagement with the process that leads to enriched disclosure, therefore can ultimately have really great downstream impacts on the quality of the IP that's gained. Yeah. You know, you, uh, you know, oh, go ahead, Jim, go. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to mention, I think something Carlos said is really important. And that's why I keep coming back to, you know, how you title this gene augmented intelligence, because mm -hmm. the art, the uniqueness score, all the components, it's part of a process. And if you really want to get the full ROI out of software like this, you have to think about the whole process and things like encouraging um, structures where you can promote consideration of alternative or multiple embodiments like Caden and Carlo are talking about, I think is critical because it's very easy to leave something on the table, whether it's because of a time lag, but, but also because of this issue of embodiments, I think is a good point as well. Yeah. Now, I, I'm always a fan of trying to make things e easier. You know, I, and uh, somebody told me, a, a professional inventor friend of mine told me that, you know, inventors are the laziest people in the world. And I looked at him and I'm like, what do you mean? And he said, an inventor will spend years of their life to save somebody 15 seconds on a task that they do every day. <laughs> You know, and it's like, okay, you know, so, and it, it is, it's true, right? So, but in, if you can save time for inventors and at the same time, make it an increasing quality, then that that's a win-win for everybody here because the inventors, whether we as patent attorneys like it or not, the, the engineers and scientists that are inventing often don't, maybe even more than often, frequently, don't see inventing as a part of their job. And maybe even more importantly, the company who's hiring you to do the work doesn't see inventing as the part of the engineer or scientist's job. You know, they want them in inventing and engaging in the, the build of the product or service, not so much cooperating with you. That's why they're hiring you. So if you can find tools to, ex to maximize the time that you do have with them, I think that that's, that's so helpful and so beneficial. And the, the other thing is, you know, I'll throw this out there for what it's worth, is I, I think I heard about this from, from John White. You know, many of you know John White is, you know, the patent bar, the guy who helped you pass the patent bar many years ago. Um, so uh, John told me that he had a colleague one time that, and again, Kate, it was in the mechanical area like you were talking about. Uh, and he, what he would do is it, he'd get, you know, the information and then he'd get all the drawings done. And then he would have, and this is back when we would actually meet with people, <laughs> you know, uh, and, you know, the dark ages, you know. So he would go to the, the client and sit down and would meet with the inventor and he'd have all his drawings there and the inventor would be there and he would then dictate the detailed description with the inventor in the room. And they would go through the pictures and so that he would have the inventor and he'd say, okay, explain this to me, you know, and then he would translate that into patentees. Okay, next drawing, you know, and at the end of this, like one hour with the inventor, he'd have the almost the complete draft of the application done. Um, and then it would be, you know, so that was a very, he found a very effective use of the inventor's time. Um, what time he ha was entitled to with the inventor. Now that doesn't work obviously with every type of invention, but it can work with some. Um, Carlo, you know, I could maybe make a comment, sir. We've been talking a little bit or a lot about time, the inventor's time, but also thinking about time of Kate outside counsel for, uh, yeah. and really um, thinking about sort of at least fee arrangements and really the the constraints that often clients uh, like us uh, place on um, great outside counsel, but having an invention disclosure that really has some of those basic building blocks, if this is done well, thinking about the whole process, as Jim says, can lead to, I think, more time for outside counsel to do their creative magic and to think about 
business issues versus struggling just to try to find time to describe the technology. So I think there is a lot of synergy overall uh, that hits this in a lot of different angles. Yeah. So let's see if we can pick off a couple questions here. Um, when a company intends to commercialize an invention, how can AI facilitate the request investigation of whether there is a freedom to operate? Is, is that is that possible um, or are we still not there yet with respect to freedom to operate? Did that. I, I don't, freedom to operate is hard, right? And even yeah. if Carlo's company would come to me and say, go do this freedom to operate search, the first thing I would tell him is like, here are our limitations, right? Yeah. And no matter how much money you throw at me, it's still gonna be incomplete. We're not translating right. um, Chinese patents, you know, and thoroughly uh, investigating all of those. Um, so, and then with being your own lexicographer, uh, which some drafters take high liberty with, right? You're really not going to understand the breadth of a claim uh, for some patents until you sit down and you really study it. And maybe even then, not quite sure, right, at the end of the day. Um, and if you're considering, you know, well, is this a valid one or not in the um, types of your results? So I think that it can help you to say, all right, here are the countries we want to look at. Here are the date ranges, here are some, you know, maybe you say here's the class, here's some keywords, and it will give you a starting ground. Um, but not nobody, not even humans and not humans with technology can do a thorough FTO. And I think um, if you left a machine to do it on its own, it, it would be, um, it's only a starting ground. It's just not a complete result. So yeah, I'd Kate, have to say I'd have to agree with that. I mean, Jim, do you want to add something? Oh, sorry. Well, just just one thing, Gene, which is that yeah, I I, I agree a hundred percent. We do have another product we didn't cover today, Innovation Q, that can help with some of the searching. You know, it, it can address some of the problems on the searching end of it because the natural language processing, there are machine learning algorithms that can pull in related synonyms, try to deal with the applicant as their own lexicographer problem in a variety of ways in terms of how you how you train the system and how you retrieve the documents. Um, so I think where the AI at the current state of the art can fit the best in is in helping you retrieve better documents to review for the analysis, but it's not gonna give you the legal conclusions or actually do the analysis of the, you know, the claims versus the, the documents. But I think AIs, including, you know, uh, ours at IP.com, uh, have advanced to the point where they can help quite a bit in retrieving the right set of information to do the FTO on. Yeah, and that that brings up another question that that we have about um, what databases are used in this process. Are you using da uh, patent databases in your in the search that you use um, here that you were talking about, or, or are there other databases? Yeah, that's a great question. So in this platform. Um, Right now it's patent databases and it uses um, the ones that have the best quality for machine machine learning. So at the moment, this particular software is looking at IP5 plus WIPO plus um, Germany um, mm -hmm. in doing this analysis. And that's based on a lot of um, you know work that we did um, in terms of the, the optimal way to, to organize it. Um, but we have additional uh, jurisdictions in some of our other offerings like Innovation Q and have you know a, a non-patent literature in that. But for the inventor's aid, um, it focuses on the ones I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So um, we have been, we're getting a lot of questions about specifically what it is that the tool does. So I think you might, Jim, need to look at these questions and follow up. I mean, they're, they're pretty specific um, and maybe even do a demo. I mean, we've had some people ask for you know a demo and I think you know uh, we'll forward all of these questions on to ip.com and they can follow up with you specifically. But this one about AI interpreting images, are we at the point where AI can interpret images that somebody might have? Let's say that, you know, the, the prototypical inventor is one who's at the bar one night, you know, after a drink and is kind of loosened up and, you know, his brain is working a little bit freely, scratches on an, a, a napkin, you know, the light bulb, you know, can an AI, can can you scan that in and can an AI work with that yet? 
uh, I, I guess I'll start. I think yeah. it depends on what you mean, right? So there's a lot of great image processing being used in uh, autonomous vehicles and other areas that can do general categorization of a couple hundred different, say, categories, even in real time, even on videos. And you can see some of that on, on a number of large corporations' websites that talk about how that type of processing occurs. If you're talking about something that, say, as detailed as a design patent and as subtle as, say, distinguishing one design patent in the same class from another, using an AI. I don't think we're quite there at the state of the art, but I'm always optimistic that there's problems that can be solved in, you know, in the future, but mm -hmm. that is a different order of magnitude. So I think it's an extremely challenging problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Carlo, with respect to the, the one thing that we haven't talked about is uh, we, we've kind of alluded to it, but the patent review committees, um, you know, there's a whole lot of different ideas about what is a patent review committee. And we've kind of talked about some different business models. And Kate mentioned the, you know, the startups where it's only the founders and, you know, they're actually the decision makers. So they are the inventor is the review committee. And um, can you give us an idea of like, if you're, well, maybe what you guys do or what you think is like a, a good model for a review or how, you know, how does a review go like from when an inventor has got something, you know, what, what stages should a review go through before it gets green lighted? I mean, because budgets aren't what they used to be. And, um, you know, maintenance fees continue to get more expensive. So and take up more and more of your budget to begin with. So you, filing decisions have to be smarter. Right. Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's it does go back to sort of the, the paradigms that we talked about filing versus marketing driven. But I think ideally, if you have um, a really good alignment in what the innovators are working on and the direction of the company, the priorities, actually, I mean, the ideal I've seen and we sometimes implement is we have honestly a light review where actually it's almost by the time you have a committee meeting, it's almost a foregone conclusion of what direction you're heading into because there is that alignment there's a natural filter that, that occurs uh, but in other situations where you, you do have sort of more conceptual inventions that really are outside the, the bailiwick of the typical focus of the company then I think it really really behooves you to hopefully form those committees with people who have been instilled with a sense of IP culture and are not really thinking about the pure numbers game or just trying to to, to uh, reward in, in, uh, people on the team but are really thinking about value having some sense of of in in the scheme of things the the how, is it a very specific invention or is it something broader how could it fit in the landscape so i, I it's hard to really answer it in, in the abstract but i would say in each case you it, ultimately you need uh reviewers or participants who have been sort of trained with um, a more sophisticated mindset that's thinking about strategy and value versus just uh, to be sort of pejorative but uh, nifty ideas that um, this sounds great someday we could use that but it's extreme extremely speculative but again that goes back to the vacuum where if you're not as the ip practitioner trying to direct the team and directions that are really thinking about value and grounding them in a, a rational uh, analysis and assessment, you're likely to have that vacuum filled by um, things that are really arguably not going to do much for the company other than, yeah, create patent counts and maybe pad some, some wallets of some inventors through the invention system reward. Yeah. Yeah, so if I if I heard you right, what I was thinking I was hearing you. So like a lot of times within projects, you know that when you're working on a like like for Milwaukee Tools, for example, under that brand, you're working on a new type of of tool with some new features. You know that what what, what you come up with, you're you're going to file a patent on. So that doesn't necessarily need to go to a review committee. But if somebody were to come up with something that is like off by a certain number of degrees from what you guys are doing that those are the type of things that you really want to make sure that you have a review committee to to make sure that it fits with somewhere within the business 
plan and strategy of the company, right? Exactly. Yeah. Or, or at least that there's some opportunity to maybe sell it or license it to somebody or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, um, Kate, we have a question here, and it's a it's a it's a software question. It's a pretty open ended question, but uh, it's about blockchain, and it asks us to discuss blockchain and how that might affect the future of software patents. And that's a huge, huge question. But um, do you do blockchain patents? And can you give us any kind of uh, update on where? A while ago, we had done some sort of um, patent trends analysis where we looked at how many there were. There weren't a lot. It was picking up a lot um, in terms of the number, but the numbers are still very small. It is a very difficult field to get patents in. I think this relates to what Carla was talking about with the patent review committees. One thing that's important in those kind of assessments is to understand how different ideas fit into the business model. But it's also really important to have patent savvy people in those discussions because there are some things you're not going to get through the patent office, no matter how valuable it might be. Blockchains can be in that space and you need to be really strategic about how you try to protect that type of technology because it has all of these like taboo wards in it, right? We're talking about money. We're talking about you know, things that are traditionally thought of as business methods, right? These are triggers to have a hard time in the US patent office. And so you need to then really like not concentrate on all of these terms where Gene, if you and I were talking about blockchain, we would yeah. be talking about those types of things. And I understand not all of blockchain is associated with money, but frequently it is associated with things of value, right? And so I think that um, it, it has not been talked about so much lately. There is not a lot of patents on it. I mean, in the patent context, um, there's not a lot of patents on it. It is difficult to get them through. It is doable to get some of the blockchain patents through, um, but it takes a lot of strategic thinking. And probably going back to our you know, initial discussion about Jim's tool, if you have the technology or the people who are kind of directing you in terms of, you know, that detail is not going to work, um, either because it's out there um, or because it's just not going to get through the patent office, that's that will help you save your money. I think that's another thing that we need to think about. It's not just you know whether or not it's um, important for the business, but it's a complete loss and harmful for the business if you're not going to get this through the, the patent office, right? Right, because if you apply for it, then it's going to become general knowledge. I mean, so some of these things that you know are not going to be issued or very unlikely to be issued, uh, you probably want to keep as a trade secret. Or, or if you decide to apply for them, you're going to want to apply and waive publication or, or those types of things. So there's, you know, there's a lot of consi strategic considerations there, and and it's it it really is. Uh, it's odd to say what Kate just said, but I, you know, just let me completely echo it. If you have a software process that it all deals with money, and you try and focus on the money aspect, the making money, the transaction of money, um, that is the kiss of death. And also the kiss of death, believe it or not, is saying that your your processes work across all platforms. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's the whole reason you have software. That's the whole goal is to have one piece of software work across every kind of platform, cross platform functionality, you know, um, but that means, oh, that's just, you, that's just generic then. You know, there's nothing special about something that works on whatever you turn on. You know, oh my God, it's like these judges don't own computers, but that's a different conversation for a different day. So um, we have gone through an entire hour here. This has been very enjoyable. I really appreciate the, you taking the time. We're at the point in the conversation where we need to wrap up with final thoughts. Um, and let's go in the same order that I uh, introduced you in. And what I'd like to do is ask you, what is it that you hope that people are going to remember from this presentation? Carlo. I would say that just to echo what I think we've been talking about, but really thinking as one moves forward to really start leveraging or continue leveraging technology in an already complex process with many stakeholders, many collaborators, but putting all those pieces together really is going to lead to higher quality higher value for the end product. Great. Thanks, Carlo. Always appreciate you joining us. Thank you so thank you so much. 
Kate, your final thought today. Um, again, it's tying back to your business strategy. So what is your goal with your patent system? Is it to encourage creative ideas? Is it to block competitors? Is it to protect your core product? Um, and then you can use technology and you can use people and hopefully you're using a combination of both of them um, to help you achieve that. And starting as early as possible, if you can help direct the idea submissions already to, towards those goals, and then when the people come in, it makes their job all the easier. You'll have a stronger patent application, higher chances of getting it allowed. So there's this flow. Um, it's always tied to the ultimate business objectives uh, of the IP uh, system within the overall entity. Great. Thanks a lot, Kate. Appreciate you uh, joining us here on short notice and earlier this week as well. And Jim, your, your, your final thoughts here today. I'll give you the final word. Well, thank you so much, Gene. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be invited on this panel, have a chance to show uh, IQ Ideas Plus and Inventors Aid. Um, really, my final thought, I think, to everyone is I feel like we're on the cusp of a new type of digital divide. And it, it, it's not going to be about things like internet access uh, as in previous divides, but it's probably going to be about deployment of artificial intelligence um, and companies that are getting ahead of that uh, should see some pretty substantial accelerations in terms of their filings. Uh, I think we'll see that trend continue in the next couple of years. And um, the, the class of technology we were able to show today, um, I, I wanted to, to thank everyone at IP.com for working real hard on. And I promise uh, there's contact information in the slides and we'll follow up with all the questions we can get to today. Yeah, yeah. And uh, all those of you who are asking for, for a demo, or have you know specific questions about? Uh, I, I think there was a couple questions about security and NDAs and and that sort of thing that you know really get into the the what's under the hood, so to speak. Um, I'll have Jim follow up with with you guys on on all that. But thank you so much for uh, this presentation. I thought it was I thought it was wonderful, and I think that this is a great tool. So um, you all have a good rest of the day, panel, and all of you who joined us from wh wherever you may be. Thank you for your questions and thank you for uh, listening. But that's all we have for today. And we hope to see you at another event here in the future. But that's it for today. Bye for now.